right into the Word of God today, and I want to invite you to join me, if you would, this afternoon in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to begin this afternoon at verse number 17. We'll be reading about 14 verses as we will read down to verse number 30. Ephesians 4, 17 through verse 30. The King James text today reads, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that he henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the light of God, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And boy, people think this preacher talks plain, huh? Amen. That, what Paul just said wasn't very nice. <laughs> Continuing, verse 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. Listen, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that he put off concerning the former conversation or former behavior, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that he put off the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now this is the verse I want you to really pay attention to. Verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Amen. I want to clarify some things. I'm telling you, folks, uh, I've told you a lot of affirming churches, especially Spirit-filled, Pentecostal affirming churches, they go so far out of their way to try to sound like a mainstream Pentecostal Spirit-filled church. Listen, they're going to reject you no matter what you preach. Accept you. You can try to sound as much like big brother, big sister as you want to. They are not going to accept you regardless of what you preach. So you have an opportunity as one who is rejected by the majority of the family. 
finally, listen to me carefully, you had the opportunity as one who is rejected to buck the mainstream and set straight some stuff that hadn't been preached right. Mm -hmm. See, I want to tell you, when I came out and I came into a affirming ministry, the Lord had called me to a, to a, a, a prophetic ministry when I was young. But when I came out into a affirming ministry, I literally became empowered by the Holy Ghost to preach, thus saith the Lord. And if it contradicted what every other Pentecostal church in America preaches, so be it. One of the advantages to the mainstream rejecting you and setting you aside as though you have no value and you have no place in the church, you know what? That setting aside completely removes from me any desire in the universe to try to fit in. It removes from me any desire in the universe to try to win your approval. So now, when the Lord shows me something, and he says, hey, the mainstream church has gotten this wrong. I don't have any problem in the world preaching it right. Because I know they're going to get ticked off, but they were ticked off the minute I got in the pulpit. So it don't bother me if what I have to say is going to further tick them off. But I'm going to talk to us today on the topic, signed, sealed, delivered. Hallelujah. Signed, sealed, delivered. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to walk out of this service today with a whole brand new understanding of some things. And you're going to know it's the Word of God. Trust me, you're going to know it's the Word of God. Let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer, Master, once again, God. The time has come for the Word of the Lord to be delivered to the saints of God. And how can I possibly be of any help to your people without the anointing of the Holy Ghost? Lord, I honestly do not know a man who is more flesh and blood. I do not know a man, Lord, who is full of more faults and failings than myself. It is an honor, it is a privilege to be called of God, to preach the Word of God. And yet so many times I've questioned, why me? Why on earth, Lord, did you call me? The answer comes back because there's one aspect of your personality that I can use, and that is you're willing to speak whatever I put in your mouth. And Master, today I am willing to speak that which you have placed in my mouth. Empower me by the Holy Ghost, embolden me, that I might declare, thus saith the Lord, unto the people of God, let us not only those of us in this building, but those who are watching and those who will later watch by reason of the internet. Let us, every one, walk away from this message with a brand new understanding, a brand new revelation, a brand new source of joy and strength in our life as the Word of God instructs us on the nature of being signed, sealed, delivered. We ask it all in Jesus' wonderful, mighty, powerful, saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may recognize the term signed, sealed, and delivered. You may remember some while back there was a song, Signed, Sealed, Delivered, I'm Yours. Amen. That is a song by American musician Stevie Wonder, released in June of 1970.
informed any of you were born. I was around not very long, but I was around. I was in kindergarten when this song came out. But it was released as a single on Motown's uh, Tamla label. Spent six weeks at number one on the U.S. Rhythm and Blues chart and peaked at number three on the U.S. pop chart. The phraseology, signed, sealed, and delivered references the process that one must go through when making a major purchase like a car or a house. When we make a major purchase, you know, buying a car, buying a house, it's not generally true that most people walk around with tens of thousands of dollars of cash in their back pockets. There's usually a process that we must go through uh, involving our purchase uh, and that process includes that we agree upon the purchase, we secure the purchase, and then finally the purchase is executed. In car sales, I sold cars for a number of years, new cars and used cars. In car sales, the term for the execution of the deal or the finalization of the deal is referred to as delivery. So uh, when you're a car salesman, your manager will ask you sometime, so did you deliver that car this morning? That doesn't mean did you bring it to the customer's house? No, but what it means is, did the customer come in, sign the paperwork, all every uh, financing is fully arranged, all the money has exchanged hands that needs to exchange so that they then could take delivery. They could take the car home with them. Now many years ago when you went into a car dealership, you would have to agree upon a price after you negotiated with the salesman. And you'd agree on the deal, you'd put it on paper, you'd write it out, a contract, you'd sign a contract, and you could go home that day and tell your friends, I just bought a new car. But were you driving it? No. Had you taken delivery of it yet? No. Because in those days, it took a few days to get your financing all settled, to get the car registered, to get the plates on it. And so it used to be years ago, for those of you a lot younger than me, that when you bought a car, it took several days. You'd go in, you'd sign the contract, you'd give them a down payment, and then you would later, when everything was settled, they say, okay, come in Friday, and you can pick up your car. You can take delivery of your car. That's how it used to be. Nowadays, with the computer age, everything is so quick, everything is so fast, you can go in, agree upon a price, sign the initial contract, pay your down payment, and wind up taking delivery an hour or two later and driving the car home. Well, it wasn't quite that fast some years back. But in car sales, the finalization of the deal is referred to as delivery. The customer is said to take delivery of the vehicle they have purchased. In real estate or when buying a home or a business, the term is used closing. When the purchase is finalized, the buyer participates in a process involving the transfer of large sums of money and the signing of numerous legal documents. This final purchase step is referred to as a closing. So it is in the life of a child of God. We have been signed for in that the Lord has done that which is necessary to secure our salvation. I want to tell you, saints, when Jesus declared on the cross of Calvary, it is finished, hallelujah, he just signed on the bottom line, glory to God, and everyone who will believe and obey
He signed on the bottom line. But the purchase process is not yet complete. Amen. Amen. Signing the contract, the initial contract, is only step one. Secondly, it is necessary that the deal be sealed. I remember when I was selling cars, we knew that if that deal was going to be safe, meaning that there was no chance in the world the customer was going to back out of it, we needed to get from them, listen to me, the largest down payment we could get. Because the more that customer had invested in that contract, the more the customer had invested in buying that car, the less likely that customer was to back out and decide, now nah, I'm not going to buy it after all. No, because you invested a down payment, and guess what? You don't get that back. You don't get your down payment back. No, no. If you change your mind, then that money belongs to the dealer because why? You had a deal. You had a contract. You signed on the bottom line. Well, I've got news for you today. According to the Word of God, according to the writings of Paul to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesus chapter 4 and verse 30, he said, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. What does Paul mean when he says you have been sealed? He said, Jesus signed on the dotted line. Oh, but by the Holy Ghost baptism, when God puts his spirit in your life, he is investing in his purchase. He is making a large and a substantial down payment which guarantees that he will not go back on the deal. In real estate, when you make an initial down payment agreeing upon an offer to make the seller, you give the real estate agent working with you an offer. You put it on paper, you sign it, but better be some money with that offer. If you ain't got some money going with that offer, if that offer ain't going anywhere, that real estate agent isn't even going to carry it to the seller if you haven't written a check. And just like anything else, the more you write it for, the more likely the seller will be motivated to agree to your terms. The money that you give to the real estate agent when you make your offer on the house is referred to as earnest money. That earnest money means you are demonstrating financially how committed you are to this deal. Obviously, the more you put in the earnest, then the more you're saying to the seller, hey, accept my terms and I'm ready to go. Listen to what Paul told the same church at Ephesus in Ephesus 1, verses 9 through 14. He said, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in, his, in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, 
both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Now listen, verse number 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after, listen carefully, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. After you believed, my Baptist friend, I got news for you. The Holy Ghost don't come into your life when you believe the gospel. Paul said to the men he found who claimed to be followers and disciples of Jesus Christ, he asked them this question. Right? Yeah. 
Well, we go to the altar and we believe the gospel. And by believing the gospel, we affix our name. Hallelujah. We sign our name. And in Jesus, he dips his finger in the blood that flows from Calvary. And in blood, he signs his name beneath ours. Hallelujah. Yeshua, the Christ. Hallelujah. And that contract is now a very valid contract. But there must be a down payment. There be some earnest money. There has to be an investment in this deal. And God fills us with the Holy Ghost as the earnest, as the down payment, as the way of sealing the deal. Hallelujah! Sign! Sealing! Glory to God! The signature represents the buyer's intent. The earnest money or the down payment is representative of the buyer's commitment to the purchase. The delivery is when we finalize all the terms of the purchase and take delivery of that which we have purchased. In Ephesians 1, Paul refers to it as the redemption of the purchased possession. You see, you can have all kinds of coupons in your wallet. You can have all kinds of coupons in your purse. But if you don't take that coupon out, and present it to the person representing that company, that retailer, that store. If you don't take it out and present it at the time of your purchase, then you have not, listen to me, you have not redeemed that coupon. I don't care if you got a coupon for 90% off of everything you buy. If you don't give it, when you make your purchase, you're not able to redeem that coupon. No, you're going to present it at the time of purchase so that that coupon can be considered redeemed. That is what redemption is for the church. We see by faith. I am redeemed, bought with a price. Jesus has changed my whole life. If anybody asks me the source of my joy, I'll tell them I am redeemed. But you know what? You're not yet. Now, when we sing about being redeemed, when we talk about being redeemed, we are speaking in faith. We are speaking on the premise that God has promised not only that he would sign for us, that God has promised that not only would he make a down payment in us and for us, but that he has promised he will redeem us. Hallelujah. He's going to make good on that contract. He's going to make good. He is going to take delivery of his purchased possession. And we call that redemption. Oh, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, the Lord Jesus Christ declared, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am. Isn't it funny? He didn't say that where I am Daddy Jehovah Arthur. Oh my God, no. He said, oh honey, when I come to get you, I'm coming to get you so that where I am, there ye may be also. Hallelujah. 
mercy. They wanted to stone Jesus when he made the declaration before Abraham was. I am. Oh, I'll tell you, the biggest mistake that 90% of the Christian world makes, they read the Bible from a westernized perspective. You can't do that. It was written, honey, by Jews. Most of those people had very little exposure to Gentiles at all. Most of those men had never spent time in the company of Gentiles. If you think that just because they were part of the early church and God filled them with the Holy Ghost, that all of a sudden their perspective changed and the way they understood things changed, and the way they expressed things changed, and the way they said things changed. You're out of your tree. No, every word they wrote, they wrote as Jewish men. And Jewish men, when they use certain phrases, they mean it differently than the way we westernized minds understand it. When a Jewish reader reads the word Son of God, he does not see the second person of the Holy Trinity. I asked many, I lived in New York City for 10 years. I used to love to do this. I used to love to go up to rabbis and Hasidic Jews with the little curly cues and the big hats and the long black coats. And I would ask them over and over, I did this, I don't know how many, probably hundreds of times, but I did it for a reason. Because every time I asked the question, my faith was affirmed. My oneness faith was affirmed. And I'd ask those Jewish men, I'd say, may I ask you a question? I said, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I am not trying to convert you. This is not a, I'm not trying to preach at you or anything. I said, I'm asking this as a theologian. I want to understand as a person of the Jewish faith. When Jesus Christ is described in, in the Bible, the New Testament, as the Son of God. Or when he refers to himself as the Son of God, I said, who is he saying he is? Let me tell you a little secret. Not one time, not one time in a decade did anybody of the Jewish persuasion ever say to me, well, he claimed to be God's offspring. He claimed to be the second person of the Holy Trinity. No, no. Because the Jewish writers who use the title Son of God are understood by Jewish readers. And every one of them will look at me and say, he claimed to be God. Period. God. He wasn't claiming to be God's son, you know, God's second person of God. No. When you see the word son of God, he said, Jews cannot speak of a man as being God because that is automatically considered idolatry. Okay? He said, but when God would appear as a theophany, and what that is, that is a theological term that means God appearing as a human being. All right? Usually, though, a theophany was a temporary manifestation. For instance, when the Lord appeared to uh, Jacob 
and wrestled with uh, Jacob, or when he appeared uh, to um, Abraham concerning Sodom and Gomorrah, right? That was a temporary manifestation. But the word of God said three men came to Abraham. But we understood those men to be God and two angels. Am I correct? Amen. So that term is theophany. And when God appears in human form, you do not say, oh, this is God, because just saying those words right or wrong is considered idolatry. Therefore, they have this little shortcut that they use. Whenever they see God appearing in a human form as a man, they refer to that man as, listen to this now, the Son of God. They mean he is God. But they don't say that. They say the Son of God. By doing this, they bypass that venturing into idolatrous territory. Do you follow what I'm saying? You see, you got to understand, the Jews are so careful about keeping every little point of the law. They are so careful about this that there are many things they won't do, there are many things they won't say, simply because, for instance, you won't hear a Jew running around writing on paper the word God, G-O-D. No. If a Jew's writing you refers to God, you'll see them do G-D. They don't put all the letters in. Do you know why? You know why? Because the law says not to use the name of the Lord in vain. So in order to bypass that, do you follow what I'm saying? They'll do G dash D. That way they're not using any reference to God in vain. Any reference to God in vain. The same thing is true of the term son of God. It is a bypass. It is a way for Jews to refer to a human being who is in fact God. Now, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, let's go back to three Jewish men standing in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And old King Nebuchadnezzar come up to the edge and he looked in and he said, did we not throw three men into that fire? Three what? Three men. Said, yeah, did we throw them in their bound, tied up? Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. Well, then how come I see four men loosed, walking all around? They're acting like that fire. Don't even bother them. They're acting like they're on the beach, not like they're in the midst of a burning hot, fiery furnace. Believer, I want to tell you. Nebuchadnezzar made this declaration. And the fourth man appears as, listen, the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar was a heathen. He was an ungodly man. He was not getting some revelation from God about the Trinity. No. He was using the language of of the day to refer to a man who in fact was God. So rather than Nebuchadnezzar say, the fourth man appears to be God. What he was saying in effect was, the fourth man appears to be God 
in human form. So when Jesus Christ came and was declared, the angel said, to be the Son of God, they were not saying, honey, that he was God's offspring in any spiritual sense. They were not saying he was the second person of the Trinity. No, no. They were saying he is a man who in fact is God. He is a man who has no earthly father. The only father he has is God. And let me tell you a secret about our God. Unlike the gods found in uh, in the old ideologies, uh, uh, the Roman gods and the Greek gods, our God does not engage in coitus with women to produce offspring, mm -hmm. who then are demigods, meaning they are part gods and part you. No, no, no. Our God did not have intercourse with Mary. That's right. That's right. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God had intercourse with Mary. Amen. No. Mary, listen to me, was still a virgin. She was. Even after she had conceived the baby. Yes. How is that possible? Well, it's easy because she had never copulated with anybody including God. No. The Word of God tells us that the Holy Ghost overshadowed her. And then I love what the angel said. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I, I love the Word of God. I love what the angel said. At one point, the angel said, and that holy thing. <laughs> he said, that holy thing. That is for me. What do you mean, that? What do you mean, they, how can we refer to the incarnation of God Almighty as a thing? Well, it's easy. One the baby. One the traditional baby. Come on, come on. One the traditional human. Yes, yes, he, couldn't yes, use, yes. he couldn't use traditional terminology. Yes. He didn't say that baby. No, no, no. He oh. said that holy My thing. God. There is something. Oh my God, he said that holy thing. Holy, it is unique, it is powerful. Oh honey, it is divine. Glory to God. Therefore, it is the holy thing that is within you. And the angels told Mary, they told Joseph, that he shall be called. They didn't say, he shall be the son of God. That's not what it says. They told Joseph in the dream, they told Mary, he shall be called the son of God. Why? Because that title implies God in human form. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, signed, sealed, and delivered. In order for Jesus Christ to sign his name on the contract for our ultimate redemption, he had to go through a tremendous process that began at birth. I'm going to say something that I guarantee you 95% of churches, if not more, will never save you. They will never, as a matter of fact, they get mad at me for saying it, but I know it's scriptural just as sure as I'm alive. Theology loves to, they, they love to get these ideas in their head and then try to make scripture agree with what they think. Truth stands on its own. We have to conform to truth. We don't try to make the truth conform to our theology. That's right. Most churches will tell you, Jesus Christ took all the sins of the world on the cross of Calvary. Um, no. He paid for the sins of the world on the cross of Calvary. That's right. 
But you know where he took on the sins of the world? In a little thing called the manger. He was born into sinful flesh. He was born a fallen man, just like you and I. That's the whole point. That's the whole, that's what made it possible for him to pay the price for all of us. The word of God said what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Listen, God sending his own son, listen, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me Jesus walked around holy and perfect fleshly. No. Paul said in, in to Timothy, he said, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But then listen, he said, justified in the spirit. What did he mean by that? He meant in the flesh, he was born into sinful flesh. But in the spirit being God, he was perfect. He was justified in the spirit. So you had a man in a perfect spirit living in a sinful body. And that's what allowed him to go to the cross. That's what allowed him to pay the price. Oh, hallelujah to God. Oh, children, I will tell you. Immediately upon closing, excuse me, upon securing us, closing the deal and redeeming his purchased possession, immediately after the entirety of the purchase process is complete, he has signed, he has sealed by the Holy Ghost, and he has redeemed or he has taken possession of his purchased possession somewhere between earth and glory our God is going to customize us you see you cannot make alterations to a car nor can you renovate a house until after listen to me now children until after you have finalized the purchase. So it is with our redemption. The Lord is going to change us. He's going to convert us. He's going to transform us. He's going to make us ready to live in an environment where holiness is the sand upon which our feet shall walk. Hallelujah. Where holiness is the sand under our feet. 
Glory to God. First John 3, 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knoweth him not. Well, who's him? In this sentence, there are two words used that speak of the subject of the saints. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. So we know he's talking about God the Father. But then he said, therefore the world knoweth us not, because they knew him not. Who's him? God the Father. Hallelujah. Because they knew him not. They don't recognize us as his sons because they didn't recognize him as the Father. Oh, hallelujah. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, yes. for we shall see him as he is. <laughs> Beloved, how the Father has loved us. And while we're still stuck here on planet Earth, we are called the sons of God. You know why? Because even if you sign that contract and you pay them earnest money, you can go home and tell your friends, I bought me a car. You didn't bring it home yet, but that's okay. You can tell your friends, I bought me a car today. Am I telling the truth? You see, that's, that's how we're able to call ourselves the sons of God. Because the contract is signed and the money has been paid. The earnest has been paid. The deal has been paid. We're just waiting on the delivery. And Paul said, excuse me, John said in 1 John 3, he's all we're waiting on now, my friend, is the delivery. <laughs> and we know that when the deal is finalized somewhere between earth and heaven, there's going to be a change. Hallelujah. Somewhere between earth and heaven, that which is earthly is going to become heavenly. That which is carnal is going to become immortal. That which is unholy, oh, is going to become holy. Hallelujah. Oh, so that we might see him as he is. God told Moses, Moses, you can't possibly look upon me. You cannot possibly look. He said, if you were to look upon me, if I were to reveal to you my true form, he said, you would drop dead on the spot. But the promise for believers is that somewhere between earth and heaven, there's going to be a transformation. And we are going to become like him. Why? So that we might see him as he is. We're going to be able to do something Moses couldn't do. Oh, hallelujah. Don't worry, Moses, you'll be there too. The car we have purchased may have become dirty as it sat on the lot waiting for us to come and get it. May have had sand, mowed grass, or even rock salt blown all over it while it awaited our arrival. But the moment we drive it off the lot, we can make our first stop at a car wash and make it look all shiny and new before we get it home and park it in the driveway. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Somewhere between where we picked it up and where we're going, we can make some changes. Hallelujah. God news for you. So can God. Mm -hmm. The house we have purchased may have become dusty. The grass may have grown high. The shutters may have come loose from the sides of the house as the seasonal winds blew upon it. 
But the moment we have closed the deal, we're able to go in and clean and mow and prepare before we move a single piece of our personal property into it. So it is with our redemption, the moment the trumpet blows, we shall know that the closing is complete. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. It's all done. It's all finished. The purchased possession is now officially in the hands of the buyer. And any and all restoration or customization may now take place. Hallelujah. Because the buyer has taken possession. 1 Corinthians 15, 36, 44. Thou fool that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. If may chance of wheat or of some other grain, meaning Paul simply said, when you plant grain, you don't plant a stalk of grain, no, you plant a seed. The seed don't look nothing like the plant's gonna look. See, you, you can't tell when you look at seed what that plant's going to look like. There ain't a seed in the world. You can look at the seed and know what the plant's going to look like based on the seed. No, because the body of the seed is one thing. But when you bury that body and it breaks forth with new life, it becomes something very different. Paul said, this is the same concerning death for the believer. You bury the believer, we just come up a whole new way. Hallelujah. We don't come up out of I'm going to tell you, my grandma didn't come up out of that box looking like an old frail lady whose eyes were weak and whose hearing was tested and tried and difficult. No, she came up out of that box ready to run around the throne of God. She came up out of that box ready to shout the glories of Hosanna. She came up out of that box ready to dance in the presence of Almighty God. Oh, honey, what you carry is not what comes forth. You have one body, and then you have another. This is what Paul is saying. Continuing, I'm almost done today. But God giveth in a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. And there is a spiritual body. Children, I'm going to tell you today in closing, out of gratitude for the salvation which God has afforded me as an act of praise and appreciation, I've tried my best to clean up my act and to look as much like 
the shining new object that I shall one day be in glory. But all I can do, and all that you can do, is the best we can do. Mm -hmm. But what I cannot do, the Lord can. Right. And what I cannot do, the Lord will. Amen. Amen. And I got news for you. Signed, sealed, delivered. I got the Holy Ghost. Listen to me, Holy Ghost filled believer. Listen to me. This is something they won't preach in Pentecostal churches. Praise God, I've been sealed. That means <laughs> God ain't going back. Uh-uh. He put the money in. He invested in you. He will not back out of this deal. He will not back out of this deal. Oh, hallelujah. Honey, oh, everybody, if you don't yet have the Holy Ghost, you ought to be hungry for the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost seals the deal. Hallelujah. You know what, LGBT believer? I got news for you. You don't need to let people preach you into hell. You don't need to let people preach you into a state of condemnation and guilt. If you've got the Holy Ghost, listen to me, children. The deal has been sealed. Hallelujah. The deal has been sealed. The deal has been sealed. Praise God, I've been sealed. Glory to the Lamb of God. Even when I was backslid, even when I was out of church, even when I felt God hated me and wanted nothing to do with me because that's what his people and his church told me. There were times when I went through great trials and tribulations and difficulties and I looked at that little Catholic boy that I've been in a long-term relationship with. And I said, you stay here. And whatever you hear in that bedroom, don't worry about it. Leave me alone. Don't come in and bother me. And I went into my bedroom. And I got down on my knees. And I began to cry out to God. And before too long, I was talking in tongues. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Because Jesus said that the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost, would never leave us. Because once you are sealed, you are sealed, you are sealed, you are sealed, you are sealed. You are sealed. Hallelujah. And God will not ever pull out of the contract. When Peter went into the house of Cornelius. He didn't make a habit of going into the home of Gentiles, but the Lord sent an angel to him and told him that he was to go with the men who were at the door inquiring about him and preach the good news of the gospel to those who were waiting. Peter went to the house of Cornelius and he began to preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to an audience of hungry hearts. People that wanted to know God. People that wanted to know him in a real palpable way. The word of God declares, while Peter yet spake, <laughs> he didn't even finish his message. The Holy Ghost fell on that which heard. And then the Jews that came with Peter looked and they said, How? What is this? What is it? This ought not to be. This shouldn't be happening. The Holy Ghost is falling on them the same way it fell on us at the beginning in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. They were watching these Gentiles speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. 
And these Jews looking said, something ain't right about this. You know why? Because God just sealed. See, we look at it like, oh, the infilling of the Holy Ghost is just this wonderful thing. But it's so much more. It's God sealing the deal. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. I wonder if you